Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for that introduction. Again, I'm David Jones Gilardi, joined by my friend and colleague, Cedric Levon. Uh, and as, as Pedro Hi. mentioned, um, so we'll have a couple parts to this, right? So the first part, part one, uh, will be the Build a Spring Java microservice with Apache Cassandra. Uh, so we will get into an app, we'll get into a little code, we'll hook it up to an Apache Cassandra database and have some fun there. Uh, for part two, uh, as you mentioned, we'll bring in Patrick McFadden. And uh, Patrick, if you don't know Patrick, uh, he is like a god in the Cassandra community. Uh, and he's going to explain to everybody like how, how you can contribute back to the project, and then we'll end with some Q&A uh, so we can have some free form questions. And, and by the way, at any point, ask questions. If there's anything that's not clear or something you want to know more about, feel free to go ahead and ask questions and we will be watching the chat. Okay, so with that, um, so this is a, a hands-on session. We'll start off with a little bit of demo, uh, but to get you started, there are two tools in particular we're going to use today. The one you see there on the left-hand side is, is a screenshot anyway of DataStacks Astra. Um, so Astra is uh, a managed Apache service platform. It's Apache service in the cloud. Uh, we will talk more about that. Uh, we have a free tier. It's free forever. Uh, so for those of you who want to follow along with us while we do the workshop and, and do the code and everything, you're more than welcome to. Um, and that is one way to do it. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see this menti.com or mentimeter. So this is actually fun. We get to do some uh, we're going to do uh, ask you some questions, but then later on, you know, kind of you know more towards the end of the workshop, we're going to do a quiz, and the top three winners out of that quiz will get to win some swag from us. Um, so there, the minty stuff is actually pretty fun. Um, so we encourage you to join into that, and especially too for the initial survey questions, the things we ask, it kind of gives us a better idea of who all of you are. Um, so we definitely encourage you to check it out. Oops. I almost played the video there. Right, let me put myself back. My clicker was in the wrong spot. <laughs> Don't mind me. <laughs> All right. So, All right. yeah. So this is, you know, just a disclaimer. Um, this is a coding session. Uh, you know, to to kind of do it, you do need to have some experience with Java. But honestly, um, the way that we build the workshop, the way that the GitHub repository is structured. It is meant for self-service. You could do this totally at your own pace. Even if you don't know Java, you'll be able to get around and follow along just fine. Um, you can also do all of this locally on your own laptops if you wish. But what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on doing things with Gitpod up in the cloud. Um, if you're not familiar with Gitpod, it is a wonderful cloud-based IDE that is provided for free through GitHub. Um, so we're going to, once we get to the part where we show you the GitHub repository and where all the code and everything is, um, you'll see a little button where you can just click on that and launch Gitpod and launch an IDE up on the cloud and, and have everything running. It's especially useful um, if you're doing, say, collaboration with teams, but mostly if you have, like, say, a lower resource laptop and you don't want to have to go through the IDE configuration, you click a button and go, and it's, it's wonderful from that standpoint. Cedric, do you have anything you want to add on that one? Yes. Yes, so uh, I just remember you don't have right. anything to install on your machine. Uh, because we are using Gitpod, you would have a full ID in the cloud working. The database is also in the cloud. And you won't have to code really yourself. In this two-hour session, we will do code, code walkthrough, and you will start the app and execute unit test that should be working if you provide the proper yep. the proper settings. Awesome. All right. So with that, there we go. All right. So what we'll do here is these are some of the links that we're going to be working with. Um, let me grab these. We should drop these down uh, in the chat. So the first one there, uh, for those of you who are going to follow along, uh, if you go to that link, that dtsxdatastacks.io slash workshop, uh, that'll bring you to the registration for Astra. It takes just about a minute. Again, everything that we're going to do today is completely free. There's no credit card or anything like that. Um, so this will allow you to spin up a free Apache Cassandra database in the cloud that we can use to work with our code. That second link there, is that Datastax Academy Spring Boot to Do app, um, that is the GitHub repository that we're working off of today. Uh, and again, it's meant to be self-service, right? So we're going to kind of bounce back and forth between what we're showing you here in that repo. Uh, but you could co totally do that at your own pace. Um, and then the last one there, uh, for those of you who are 
interested in, in working with Apache Cassandra uh, in Java in particular, we're using the 4.9 Java driver, the Deus Ex driver, dri Java drivers for Apache Cassandra. Let's, let me get those links actually. Let me drop those. Oh, did you already drop the link? I dropped Wonderful. the link everywhere. Already. Oh, thank you. You're already on. Yeah. I, I knew you'd be there. Oh, I see it now. I didn't see it at first. You know, yeah. we are a team. <laughs> All right. So yeah. now we get into the first part of Menti. So if you would, please go to menti.com, code 875169. Let's see if I can beat Cedric to it. He's probably going to beat me to it. Uh, In the chat. What are you, you doing? Okay. So, right. Let me okay. do that on Slack then. And then what we'll do is we'll pop over to our Menti. Yes, and I already see some thumbs up that are coming in. So if you would, let me know when you get to Menti and you get in there, give us a thumbs up and we'll get those numbers. Wonderful, thank you, Cedric. And we'll wait till, let's see. Okay, we've got 40 people in here. So we'll, let's get at least 20. Come on, let's get 20 people in the Menti at oh. least. Vente, right? Yeah. Oh, do you want me Why to not? add myself? Add yourself. Yeah, Boom. Something. Oh and no! I'm sorry, Cedric. Here, you can you 50. can put yourself back. I made us small. <laughs> I shrunk oh, us. Okay. <laughs> I, I I was simply in front of the. There we go. Box. Yep, almost there. Three more. And don't forget, once you do this part later on, this is going to set you up for the quiz. I love all the thumbs up coming in. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll go ahead and and we're at 17. We're close enough. We'll do it here. All right, so again, these are just some survey questions. We want to find out a little bit more about you. These are totally anonymous, no need on that. Uh, first one is, how much experience do you have with Apache Cassandra? This is always an interesting one to see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, this workshop is meant to be live, so. This is wow. some question. Uh, this looks like almost, a, yeah. yeah <laughs> wow. It's like almost okay. everybody. That's amazing. All right. So never used it. Well, we may have to, that's good to know because there'll be some parts where we talk about Apache Cassandra a little bit. Um, we may have to uh, ensure that we explain a couple of things. Okay. Less than one year. We have one person in there who's used it a little bit more. Excellent. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll move on to the next one. And then have you been to any of our workshops before? I'm going to guess it's going to be no for everybody. Uh, we do. We no. have had workshops. Oh, we have one. Yes. What? Oh, we have two. Wow, because we, we our workshops, uh, the ones we've done out, outside of the conference and such, um, we do them for Latin America and such. Wow, that is, I did not expect that. Well, welcome back, by the way, for those of you who've been to one of our workshops before. And for those of you who haven't, welcome. And, and thanks for, again for coming and checking this out. I'm actually, I'm really surprised here. Yeah, that's cool. So we are doing those live workshop on YouTube. Uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, and I feel that best time for Latam region is um, yeah. the Wednesday at 12, yeah. um, 12, yeah, 12 p.m. Eastern. EDT. Yeah, that's my time zone. All right, wonderful. Thank you. And all right, so how did I? This one's going to be funny. You can you can select multiple in this one. Uh, how did you hear about this workshop? I have a feeling that from a conference might be it. <laughs> Oh, it came through an event. Wow. Oh, okay. I'm going to get surprised again. I'm definitely getting surprised again. How cool. Super cool. Oh, did you notice that because this is a green door, oh. <laughs> it's kind of so, so a little fourth wall here, uh, you might notice that we're using some video effects. And apparently, uh, my green screen matches to the green bar that I added perfectly. So you're seeing a background. So I didn't see funny. that coming. That's kind of fun. Oh, and I see uh, Jose in the chat says, I'm wrong because I follow you in Twitch. Huh. Well, that's good to know. We should keep the Twitch stream going. All right, then. Are oh, you using Twitch. microservices in production? How many of you are using microservices? Oh, yeah, the legacy one's always fun, right? Mm. Oh, and there's our fun Sorry. green pie again. That's funny. I think I know what it is. I'm going to try something. I hope I don't, by accident, uh, mess anything up. But if you give me a moment, let me turn that off. There. There we go. Okay. I, I see what that oh, was. Nice. OK, all right. 
All right, so it seems like we have a really good spread. There, there are some folks that do not know what microservices are, but it looks like um, there are quite a few that are using them. That's wonderful. True, nice. All right, and the last one, I believe, which programming languages do you prefer? Yeah, you can only pick the first, sounds well. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Now we used to list like all of the languages, well, not all of them, but some funny ones, uh, it, but it gets to a point where you, there's too many on the screen. All right, so so we do have, we've got a lot of Python users in here. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. All right, thank you for answering those questions and giving us that context. Now, if you would leave this window open, we're gonna come back to it later for the quiz when we go to do the swag. Yeah. All right, so first thing we wanna do is give you just a little bit of a demo, quick demo on what it is we're doing today uh, in the workshop. And then we're gonna give you an introduction into Astra. Um, I briefly mentioned what that is. I'll get into more detail later. Uh, then Cedric is gonna take it and he is gonna give you a nice primer on Spring and Spring Boot, what those are all about um, and how mm -hmm. then we can go about planning planning our application to use with Spring. Um, and then, oh okay, yeah, go ahead, Cedric. No, no, nothing. Oh, I thought oh. you were going to say something there. Oh, good. Oh, good. OK. And then um, we'll follow up then working with the data sex drivers. Now, to be clear, the data sex drivers can be used with open source Cassandra, Astra, data sex enterprise, whatever, right? So if you're using, and they're, they're, they're pretty much the standard for open source Cassandra and such. Um, there is a ton that the drivers do for you right out of the box. We'll talk about all of what that is. And then the last part is we're going to go ahead and build and test our, our basic CRUD app. So the first thing here is, you know, if you think about it, what do you usually do when you want to learn or need to new, need to learn a new language? Um, you know, many of us have our own methods for how we go and jump into a new language. Um, there is a project. Um, if you're familiar with it, by the way, let us know um, in the chats. Uh, to do MVC. Uh, so to do MVC is a project that has implemented uh, essentially a known front end UI, a, a known interface. Um, in a bunch of different JavaScript languages, frameworks, all that kind of thing. What's really neat about this is then if you want to learn a new language, let's say that you know, you're really familiar uh, using jQuery and basic JavaScript, but you want to get into React or something. Um, well, then you can start by looking at and understanding the to-do MVC application. It's a very simple app, by the way. Uh, you can start by looking at it in the language you know, and then you just go ahead and you literally can just click on um, one of the ones that you don't you see it's the same exact implementation. And then you can start taking a look at the code and making a nice comparison. Um, and a matter of fact, if I pop over there real quick and take a look at it, I mean, they have a ton of frameworks um, that are supported. Uh, and again, they're all implemented the same way. So if I go to like Ember, um, you, you know, I can then exercise the app that way. If I go to React, I can look at how it's um, implemented in React. Uh, I can look at the source code for all of these. So again, it's a nice way you can use that as kind of like a jumping board to help you understand a new language. Now, there's another project called To Do Backend. So what they did is they built off of what To Do MVC did, where To Do MVC is really the focus on the front end using JavaScript frameworks. Hence, the name To Do Backend is really focusing on the backend uh, languages, things like Java, things of the business layer. Um, so again, if I take a look. We'll go to the back end. This one, by the way, is even crazier. Um, there are so many languages here. <laughs> it gets, it's a little daunting, actually. Um, you know, we're focused on Java and Spring, so that's what we're going to be using uh, today. Um, but they, they're wonderful tools uh, if you are, again, if you're learning a new language from the front end and the back end piece to get into. Cedric, is there anything you want to add to any of that? Uh, I need, uh, I think I need to do a pull request to put our sample in this website. Yeah, I know. I was actually looking for it the other day. That's why I asked you the question I did. Because <laughs> what we're doing is because we've we, we, so so what we've done is we've taken the to do backend. That's what we're doing today. We've taken the to do backend and we've hooked it up to Apache Cassandra yes, with uh -huh. Astra, is what we've done. So matter of fact, actually, what this is doing could be used for regular uh, vanilla Cassandra as well. Um, so mm -hmm. so yeah, we should we should commit that back. That's a good idea. Okay, and this is generally what it looks like. I'm actually going to show this to you in a moment. So we're going to take the, the, the front end piece. Now, we're not implementing the front end part today, right? Uh, but we are implementing the back end REST API and then using the Swagger UI, 
to expose that API. And if you're not familiar with Swagger, it's really cool because if you've got a REST implementation in your app, Swagger allows you to very quickly and graphically explore that, that particular API. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at it, I've got it running already over here. Um, so what this will do, um, you can see here, I've got all of the different REST endpoints that I might have. Um, and so it allows me, I can just kind of like click on one, let's say I want to cancel that and I want to get, you know, implement crowd operations, I want to get all of the tasks that I might have, I can just come here to the UI, I can say execute it. Now, right now, I don't actually have any tasks in here. Um, so why don't I go ahead and put one in there? I do that every time. <laughs> every time I yes. click on the wrong you thing. Yeah. <laughs> use the post. That's funny. So let's Good say, thing. yeah, let's say I wanted oh. to create some tasks through my REST endpoint. Um, I'm going to give it a title of just demoing creating a task. I say execute. Wonderful. And now if I go back to getting the complete list of tasks, I can try that out, execute, and and I, oh, you know something? I deleted the table. I dropped the table, Cedric. I have to go recreate that when we do the tests. So. Um, oh, geez. OK. Yeah, yeah, I dropped it. That's what I did. So what we'll do, though, you can imagine what should happen there, obviously, is when you bring this up, you're going to you know, you're going to be able to interact with the REST API. Um, so anyway, for those of you who aren't, again, familiar with Swagger, it's nice because I don't have to write this in code. I can just implement Swagger, and it exposes this graphically. It's a really nice tool um, to use. Um, the last thing before I move on is just to show you, by the way, what uh, the MVC app itself looks like, or the to-do MVC app looks like. Um, so it's just a simple task list. That's all it is, right? So you can see I was kind of playing around earlier. I put in one for uh, CCOS awesomeness and some and more tasks. Um, if I want to put something else in, hello, Pedro, task, or whatever, <laughs> um, I have other interactions. You know, I can say delete a task, or I can complete a task, things like that. So what this really does is it exposes basic CRUD operations, right? They're the exact types of operations that when you're first establishing connectivity to your database from an application standpoint, you want to figure out that plumbing for, for CRUD operations, you know, create, read, update, and delete. That's what this does. So that's the front end piece. And that is then um, using the back end to talk to the database. All right, so moving on. Do we have any questions or anything? Oh, can I zoom? Yes, I can totally zoom. Yeah, when I go back, I'll make sure to zoom in. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, so Astra, simply enough, DSX Astra is a fully managed Cassandra without the operations. Um, so Cassandra is a distributed NoSQL database. Uh, for those of you, we saw in the beginning, right? A lot of folks had never used it before. Um, many of us are used to using relational databases like MySQL or you know, Oracle or whatever. Um, and the main difference is those are not distributed databases, where Cassandra by its nature and, and what it does um, is actually a database that it spans across multiple nodes. It's a distributed system that can scale up um, linearly and, and, and scale up in real time. Um, it is known for its resiliency, its robustness, um, its ability to be always on and to essentially kind of perform at scale and, and indefinitely scale. Um, some really familiar names uh, that use Cassandra and have for years, uh, folks like Apple, FedEx. Um, oh, geez, uh, there's a million others, Cedric, and I'm all of a sudden blanking <laughs> on all the good ones. <laughs> Apple, Uber, oh, Instagram. Uber, yeah, Instagram, Facebook is you know Facebook is actually where it came from. Um, geez, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, like uh, many of the banking industries. Like there's 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 a ton of big players, and there are some clusters out there that are thousands of nodes, right? And so that's one of the big benefits of Cassandra. It allows you to scale up, and and you can do it you know without incurring downtime. But what that means, what that translates into is that by the nature of being a distributed database, it's a little bit more complex to run, right? It's not the same as just having a single MySQL instance or something like that. Um, so from a development standpoint, when we're writing apps, we don't really want to be spending a lot of time messing around with the database and worrying about that. Uh, so that's where Astra comes into play, especially with the free tier. And the free tier is what we're using today. Um, so it allows you to spin up a fully managed Cassandra cluster in a couple minutes and then just get going with development. Astra was kind of, you know, is developed with developers in mind. You get a five gig free tier, by the way. So again, everything we're doing today is, is free forever. Um, so it's a five gig free tier. 
Um, it is perfect, especially when you want to start experimenting with Cassandra and you want to start understanding what that looks like from an application perspective. Uh, you can spin up as many, you know, key spaces that you want, uh, you know, tables that you need for different projects, maybe for your different applications. Um, so it, it, and it allows you to do that all up in the cloud. Uh, you don't have to worry about resources or installing anything locally, uh, anything along those lines. Okay, so with that, the first thing we want to do here real quick is spin up our Astra database. So what I'm going to do is come back over to our repo. Uh, so for those of you who are following along, we want to do two things. Um, notice here, oh, someone asked me to zoom. Let's do this. Let me zoom in, make this a little better. Let me know if that's better, if you can read that better, by the way. And I'll keep an eye. Let me know if that zooms better. So the first thing we want to do coming to the repo again, we'll drop that link down in the chat. Done. <laughs> I love Cedric. Okay. <laughs> right. So you notice there, uh, there's this opening Gitpod link. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, control click that. It's going to launch Gitpod. Uh, Gitpod is going to launch the whole uh, IDE, the repository and everything. It's going to do that on its own. Uh, but then the second link, and that's the link that Cedric just dropped, that dtsx.io slash workshop, that will bring me to the registration page uh, for Astra. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do this with you. Real quick, I'll just bring up a new window. Let's say Astra. Now, I've already regist registered. Obviously, I have my accounts in place. Um, but I'll show you what this looks like in a second. So when you go to the registration, you're going to see a, a page like this. Or like this, you can sign up with your email, with Google, GitHub, whatever you happen to have. It only takes a minute. Um, then once you get signed up, we'll kind of let everybody get to a point where, hey, okay, Octa, there we go, where you get to a screen that looks like this. All right, you should see something like this. Actually, I'm going to get rid of the one that we see here. All right, you should see a screen that looks like this. And give everybody a moment to get to that spot for those of you following around, following along. If you would give us a thumbs up in any, whether it's the chat in Zoom or in Slack, let us know that you've gotten to this spot. Yes, please. <clears throat> and yeah, didn't want to disturb. I had a question about Mongo versus oh. Cassandra as usual in the chat. Um, so I was starting on swing. Oh, well, do you want to, while we're waiting for some thumbs up, do you want to go ahead and talk to that or? Yeah, yeah, maybe. So, so let's see. First, um, so both Mongo and Cassandra are NoSQL database. Okay. So first, maybe for junior developer, you would consider moving to NoSQL database when your data does not, do not fit on a single uh, server anymore. You know, if everything is fine on a server, keep your server. Relational database are very good and have a lot of things. So uh, acid transaction, joints, um, so and ensure uh, both um, consistency, availability, and uh, network partition. So everything is fine in a single machine. In the NoSQL world, it's more distributed. Now we are working multiple uh, nodes. And so there is a theorem, a uh, famous theorem no, uh, named Mark Blue the uh, theorem or CAP. And it tells you that you cannot achieve consistency, network partition, and availability at the same time. Right. And so Mongo pick uh, consistency and network partition, and Cassandra pick availability and, uh, to, and uh, network partition. So first, even with the uh, basic architecture, you can say that Cassandra is all about availability and Mongo is all about consistency. So in Mongo, you uh, will store a JSON document and in Cassandra, you will, start, you will store tables, okay? So what are the sweet spots of Cassandra? High throughput, so very high writes, very high read uh, at the same time huge volume of data, okay? For Cassandra, one terabyte, it's nothing. Um, so in Cassandra, you will install multiple nodes. <clears throat> on a single node, 
you will have one terabyte. And if you need more capacity, add new node to the cluster. Or if you need more throughput, add new node to the cluster. It's scale linearly. That's the strong, uh, the, the main strength of Cassandra. Um, now, the data is replicated in multiple nodes. So if you lose any of the nodes, the data is still there. So second range of use case for Cassandra is really no data loss. As the data is on multiple nodes, you can lose oh, a node. It's not a big deal. OK. Um, yeah. So this is my cell uh, cap for the Cassandra. <laughs> Uh, against, not against Mongo. So Cassandra and Mongo are not competitors. Yeah. They are not dealing with the same use case. Yeah, they may bo both be in the NoSQL space, but yeah, as Cedric said, they're not, they're not really yeah. direct yeah, direct it's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. It's like tomato and cabbage, they both, they both are vegetables, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> I, I like it. the tomato and cabbage analogy there, Cedric. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so hopefully that answers. Uh, I saw the question that came through. Um, so if you have any follow ups or anything, of course, let us know. Okay, so hopefully uh, you're here at a screen that looks like this. Now, what we want to do now, we've given you the, the instructions here in the repo, right? Everything you need is actually here in the repo. Um, but when you come into it the first time after you register, you go to add database. Now, as I mentioned, you want to pick that free tier. Uh, if you get any kind of credit card, anything, it means you didn't pick the free tier. <laughs> uh, so make sure you pick yes. free. Uh, that is free again forever. Uh, it's perfect for um, uh, you know, experimenting and development and, and just kind of you know, getting your application going or getting your feet wet with Cassandra. Um, you can pick from any of the main three cloud providers, AWS, Google Cloud, or Azure. Now you'll notice in the free tier, only Google Cloud is lit up. If you go to some of the higher tiers, um, then the others will light up, right? So given it's the free tier, we kind of control things just a little bit more. Um, it's the same thing with the regions. In the free tier, you're only presented with the two regions, either US East or US West. Again, if you open that up a little bit and pick different areas, you'll, you'll see that they have regions that correspond uh, to the cloud provider that you've chosen um, and what's available there. So again, as it ramps up, but our goal here, I want to be very clear about this. Yes, as you can see that as you start to go up in tiers, you know, you start getting into paid tiers. That's not what we're talking about here. Really, the, the key is to get into Cassandra. You can use this free tier indefinitely, um, and it's really nice as a development tool. OK, so with that, I'm going to choose US East. Then once I've done that, my configure button lights up. I'll say configure. And now as I scroll down, we've provided you with the values that you need here, the database name, key space name, so on and so forth. It, for your own apps, for your own use, you can honestly use whatever you want, right? We just ask for those of you following along that you use these with us. The reason why is if there are any questions or anything that come up uh, around this, we know exactly what values you've used, and then we can help you uh, a lot more efficiently. Um, so you'll notice here, I just literally grabbed database, went to database name, so to do DB, uh, to do app for the key space, KV user for username, and KV password for password. Again, we're just using these values for today. Once you have filled all these out, and of course, as long as your passwords uh, you know, validate properly, there we go, like I would expect, then this Create Database button will light up. You see Create Database. And boom, you'll see the status go to pending. Um, it might take a minute or two, but what will eventually happen is it'll turn to the screen active, like you see here. And that's it. You have a Cassandra database. It's ready to go, right? Um, and at that point, you know, we anyone who's doing this, we'll just go ahead and leave that there. Uh, and that way, when we come back around, um, we will uh, we will then use that database uh, with our uh, with our application. All right. Do I see any questions? Okay. I see Pet. I see Cedric is posting things. Thank you, Cedric. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. All right. Excellent. Now the secure connect bundle piece. Um, I'll just I'll just wait on this. On the Cedric, you think it's a good idea to have them do it now? I figured we'd give folks a chance to get the database going and then come back. To yes. It. Yes, maybe let's come back to that later. Okay, yes, we'll come back to that. By the way, we will wait for some up on the chat just to see if you your database is ready to. That's go. right. That's right. And the secure connect bundle is actually really nice. Um, if you think about it, if you are connecting to a database that's out in the cloud uh, that is accessible by public IPs, you probably don't want just anybody to be able to walk right on your database and do things. Um, Astra is very secure, uh, and what Astra does is once your Apache Cassandra database is up. 
it will create what's called the Secure Connect Bundle. Um, that encapsulates all of your SSL, uh, like key store, trust store, all that kind of stuff that you would need from your application to connect securely to your database. It encapsulates all of that in there. It knows where your nodes are, all of that. What makes that really cool is that once you download this bundle, you just pass that in as a configuration line parameter to your driver uh, initialization when it connects to the database and it handles all of the secure connection for you. Again, it's made so developers can just get in, drop the bundle and go and you don't have to mess with it. All right, so with that, then we are gonna move into the introduction to Spring and Spring Boot. I'm looking for questions. I don't see any just yet. Um, Not yet. All right, no. so, oops, sorry, Cedric. So I will give it to Cedric. All right, okay. Um, well, so let's get that running. Um, to, just before starting, um, um, you know, I'm doing Java for, let's see, 15 years now. And I had the chance to work with Spring very early in 2004. Uh, and so Spring has been released, I think, first version in 2002. So <laughs> it was designed by Rod Johnson. And it used to be called Interface 21. During that time, it was all about application server, you know, WebSphere, um, um, uh, WebLogic, and uh, in the OSS world, more Tomcat. And all the development you you did were, you know, simply interact with the uh, application server to do database connectivity. Uh, I, I'm sure you remember about. Uh, GNDI, you know, good, sweet memories, right? Um, and so at that time, uh, Spring came with the idea to provide a lightweight framework and maybe to stay away uh, from the huge and AV application server and provide nice way to connect component one to each other. One way to do that is by implementing a pattern called inversion of control. So you define a service in a Java interface here, greeting service with method signatures, and you can have multiple implementations of this interface. When you need this, when you need to, to use this interface in your code, you will simply work with the interface and not implementation. You know, it's a loose coupled between implementation and interface. And with that, it's pretty cool because now you can have <clears throat> multiple version of your service. You can do some mock of your service. You can have multiple situation with multiple uh, versioning of your service. And you don't have to change the people who are using the code because people using the code only use the interface. Mm -hmm. Of course, now in the Java world, Spring is not the only one to provide this <clears throat> inversion of control pattern. We can think about Google Juice, but they were the first. And this is why, uh, I mean, uh, Spring was uh, a success in day zero and it was called Interface Interface 2.1. You know, I didn't know that about the Interface 2.1 part. <laughs> I didn't realize it had yes. that name originally. That's cool. Um, all right, so let's switch next slide. Okay, thank you, David. <laughs> um, and so at the at the at first, it was simply inversion of control, a little bit of annotations, uh, but more and more component have been added to Spring. And now, if you go to Spring.io, you see that Spring is a huge galaxy of multiple components. Uh, you can do whatever you like with Spring, and one part is microservice. This is the one that we will dig into today, but you can do much more than Spring microservice. You can do reactive, cloud, web apps, serverless, even driven and batches. Um, we are running multiple workshops uh, during the year and we had some content about Spring microservice, reactive and cloud. Okay, so let's dig into microservice. Okay, so if you look at Spring uh, components, this is some categories you will find. Core technology, web apps, data access, testing, integration, languages. Um, today, 
we won't use everything. If you just click next, next, uh, David, you will see that we will use the core dependency injection. We will expose an API, a REST API. So we will use the REST part to build web application. We will connect to the database. So we will use the data access. Um, to run the exercise, you will do test. So we need the test context over here. And we will simply use Java. The idea is really um, uh, keep it simple, stupid, for you to have the running app with only what needed there to start the app. OK, so if you look again, if you dig into all the categories, you can see a bunch of framework. So today, let's keep it simple, I told you. We will simply use Spring Boot. Not a lot of Spring Data, not a lot of Spring Cloud. Simply Spring Boot. So what is Spring Boot? OK, Spring Boot is really the runtime for your application. In this runtime, you will find multiple layers. The presentation layer, the REST API for us, the business layer, where you find all the algorithms, all the business logic in your service. And at the uh, bottom, you see the persistence layer, how to interact with your database. This is what we call DAO, or repository layer. And this persistence layer is interacting with the drivers. And drivers is really the piece of code that will connect to the external system like a database. So instead of running um, web, web application server, uh, now it's standalone application. It's a fat jar. And the good part of a standalone app is you can ship that as a Docker container and make it scale, um, but it does not rely on anything else. So it simplify your build and simplify the um, configuration and deployment. So Spring Boot is this runtime and you would add multiple starters in the Spring Boot. So you do have starters for metrics, health check, configuration, and much, much more. The idea is starting with Spring Boot Core. And for instance, if you need production monitoring, you will add Spring Boot Starter Actuator. If you need that uh, accessing you know, any kind of database, you can add Spring Boot Starter Spring Data, and so forth and so on. So really, Spring Boot is now the go-to uh, framework when it comes to building microservice with Spring because everything is packaged in a single runtime, the Spring Boot runtime. OK, I told you about layers. So presentation layers are the REST API for us, also called controller. The business layer is also called services. Persistence layer is repository or DAO and the database. What I want you to realize here is a service can interact with one, two, multiple repositories. The purpose of the service is composing, aggregating so data coming from multiple sources and prepare the data to be used by the controller. And that's it. And if every single layer is a slice in your sandwich, Spring Boot is really how to build a nice sandwich uh, in a I like a having a code way. sandwich. I'm now hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Code right. sandwich. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So I told you about Spring and Spring Boot. Okay, so what do you want to build with this Spring framework? OK, so as I told you, I'm pretty old in the Java world, and I, I, I was there with these kind of revolutions. <laughs> so first, all applications were monolithic. So 
The big rectangle is a single runtime. So in the mainframe, for instance, UI, uh, logic, and data were all in the single piece of hardware. And so if you want to scale maybe your compute power because you may, you know, you know, simply have more computation, you need to scale everything. And that's costly. So what do you want to do? You want to go to what they, they call that open and they split in multi-tier. Now we do a front-end, back-end, and data layer. Three runtimes, and you can make one runtime scale and not the other. And you can have people implementing only front-end with his own skills, and another implementing back-end. And in between, we created some uh, format to end change. So, you know, web services, uh, at that part, at that time, at that time, maybe RPC. Or, yeah, maybe know. sockets. I actually remember applications, sockets, they were just yeah, direct sockets. <laughs> true, true. So I think it was beginning of, so multi-tier was definitely in the 90s. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, beginning of uh, 20th century came the SOA for service oriented architectures. And now the idea is split again. We are keep using... <clears throat> Front-end, back-end, and data layer are split, but inside each box, you split again. So now in the UI, you have maybe dedicated UI for mobile, dedicated UI for web server, dedicated UI for administrators. Same in the service, you have a, maybe a dedicated runtime called a ESB, so Enterprise Service Bus, hosting one or multiple service and service can be reused, but they do have a single piece of software for the service. You know, in these ESB ar architectures, we tend to have OSGI and you can make a service scale even if it's still inside a ESB, but it's still not the best scenario, right? Same for the database. Now, RDPMS, it's not the single silver bullet database handling all the situation. You have so much data that you need to think about Hadoop or NoSQL database. We had the question before. And now let's go to the modern applications. In the UI, again, they like to split, 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 split again. So now instead of having a single UI for uh, the, 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 the web, for instance, now you do have in the, in the UI for the web, you do have single page application, you do have components inside a page, you have some native part for mobile, you, you know, you just split into component again. Those components need a very specialized um, backend just to have exactly the data they need. This is what we call backend for front end. This is where you find GraphQL technology now because GraphQL is pretty neat for total front end, you only get what you asked, and that's really uh, the proper technology JSON format to interact with front end. In the back end though, um, now each service is standalone, and we call that microservice. Okay, you got the ID with the Spring Boot, every single piece is standalone. But you don't want to implement everything, you know, like security, throttling, monitoring inside each service, even if it's possible that by simply adding stuff, it just fat service. Mm. Why not delegating those technical functions to tools like API Gateway? Put a proxy in front of all your microservice. This proxy will do authentication, throttling, monitoring for you. And service only have to expose now an endpoint for um, to be able to expose all the metrics to be monitored. So standalone services and try to delegate technical function to third parties like API Gateway, Service Mesh for a scaling uh, and service discovery for a dynamic scaling. On the data layer, we still have the same um, data technology, okay, new data Database come every day, new kind of database come every day. <laughs> you may have heard about new SQL or CloudDB or something like that. Well, 
But the, the fundamentals are still there. RDBMS, NoSQL, Hadoop. But each side, each data technology, now we think about data mesh. We split service in business domain, now we split database in business domain as well. All right. Let's move to the next slide. So what is a microservice? So I don't reinvent the wheel here. I simply reuse the, uh, the, the main books you might find on the topic. So first is building microservice from Sam Newman. We can see the small draw here. So that's some characteristics you can find. So uh, culture of automation, ID implementation, decentralized, deploy independently, um, designed for failure, and the principle is also uh, enlightened by Martin Fuller in one of these blog posts. Uh, so organized around business capability, product and project, smart endpoints, decentralized, decentralized infrastructure automation, designed for failure and evolution in design. Okay, don't want to go too much into the detail. It's mostly hands on today, but you know, as a nutshell, advantage of the microservice reduce cost. Okay, you make you scale only what you need. It reduces risk because now the microservice can be um, scaled multiple times, it can be scaled out. So if one piece fails, you, can have, you still have multiple instances to, to keep the service alive. It increases the read speed because you ship only small piece of software and it enables visibility because now everything is. Um, uh, and then in a single place for security monitoring, and you do have a nice uh, monitoring capabilities. But on the drawback, these advantages, it's complex. It's not for everyone. Having hundreds of service in your IT is not that easy. It really needs some, um, uh, you know, proper orchest orchestration, security management. It's also a culture change. And guess what? It's a bigger run footprint. Mm. Because if single service has its own runtime, it's use CPU, it's use RAM. Okay, next slide. And so the, the last part introducing you microservice is really okay. Microservice really fit the Apache Cassandra way of thinking. So I told you before, Cassandra is well known to be very good at scale out, okay? real time request, scalability at core. You need more, um, more throughput, add new nodes. You need more capacity, add new nodes. They both fit distributed architectures. So it's not acid anymore. How would you do a distributed transaction with multiple microservices? Yeah. Uh, first, I need to insert my user in my microservice one, and then I need to insert uh, the payment for this user in microservice number two. Oh, but microservice number two is not there. So do we remove uh, user doing a rollback? No, it's not working that way anymore. There is no rollback in the microservice world. So how do you do? Well, it's working the same way as Cassandra. It's basic availability of stare eventually consistency. So you will do compensation, you will introduce orchestration. Um, there are multiple ways to do that. Some are CQRS or even sourcing. And um, you will have dedicated service for business content. Okay. And you might say that, oh, but I heard that in a um, microservice, there is one database per microservice. Okay. You have to understand that when people told you that, it's not one database installation per microservice. It will be so costly. And now you lose all the benefits to have nice microservice with cost less. So the idea is simply one microservice has a, 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 you know, a domain, some resources, um, so um, with the Cassandra, you can have one key space per microservice or even one table per microservice. So resources are very limited per microservice. Hey, uh, Cedric, real quick, I just want to stop you. I'm seeing some messages that are coming in. That for some reason, a set of folks cannot see the screen. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm asking others just to make sure <laughs> before you continue and, and no one can see. I, so I'm, I'm there. I do this. I screen, see it as well. I, okay. Okay. I pin your video just to be sure that I can only see your video and not on the speaker. Yeah, so for those, um, if for some reason the video did move away in Zoom, if you go to gallery view, you should be able to find our screen. If you right click and say pin, that should bring it up so you can uh, definitely see it there. Uh, for some reason, yes. it got stuck on somebody else. I, I Now I'm seeing some of the messages. It looks like that was the case. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, it happened to me before I was seeing Pedro because it was speaker view. And I, what I did is simply go to David Gilardi video, right click and say pin video. And now I'm stuck on David for good or bad, but I, I pin <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry if you're stuck on me. <laughs> you have to look at me the whole time. <laughs> That's okay. I'm the, I'm the other side of the screen. <laughs> Fine. Okay, so it looks, I, I think it looks okay from the messages I'm seeing. All right. All right. Yeah, definitely let us know. Thank you for uh, sending the messages in. We're all watching. So let us know if you see anything else like that. Okay, and that's good because now I'm done with all the you know, um, stuff and explanation. I think we can go back to real stuff. <laughs> all right. So, um, can you take over there now? Yeah, okay, let's do that. All righty, so now we get into the fun. I should go back over here. All right, let's go back over this way. All right, so I did see that there were some folks that uh, were asking at what point should they be at. Really, at this point, all we need to do is we've created the database, uh, if you're following along in the repo. So we've created the database. You should get to a point where you have this status active with your to-do DB database. Right, so what we're going to do is scroll down just a little bit. Now, this is the part where we get into that secure connect bundle. So I'm going to show this to you, right? So um, don't worry about it. If you're like, hey, what's he, what's he doing? He just you know, went past this stuff a little fast. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm doing. Um, so here I've got my active database. Now, if I click on my database, I'll go to a detailed section, right, where I get more detailed information on the database. Um, now, we're using the free tier, right? Since we're using the free tier, it's always going to be $0 per hour. But obviously, if you're using one of the other tiers, you would see what the cost is. Um, information that might be really useful at some point, like the username of your database, how much capacity you're using, that kind of stuff. But what we want to do is we want to connect to this database, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the connect button up here in the top right hand corner. Now, today, we're going to use the driver to connect. But you notice that there are actually multiple ways you can do this. You can connect with the REST API, a GraphQL API, which for those of you using GraphQL, that's seriously cool stuff right there. Um, we're not doing that right now. And then the driver. Uh, this is when you click on driver, you're going to see the button for the download secure connect bundle. Um, so this is the this is the part uh, where we are now going to get that bundle I talked about that we can use in our application to hook up uh, the app. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to like just flip to a different screen um, and come back over. Yeah, I need to start this up again to my app. By the way, let me reload my other Astra. I have two of these going on right now. So one thing I want to point out: if any one of you had previously been using Astra and you had a database created with a different name like I do here, and you're like, hey, I can't create this to do DB because I already have this other one, you can. Um, when you have a database created and it's active, you notice at the bottom, you'll see key spaces, uh, this add key space. Now, something we haven't really explained, if you're wondering what's a key space. So in Cassandra, a key space is just like a database or a schema in their relational counterparts, right? It's the place where we're going to hold all of our tables um, set replication. We're not going to worry about replication here, but it's where you're going to hold all your tables, the domain, right? Um, so if I did need to create another key space, I can just say add key space, put in the name, hit save, that's it. And you can see here, I actually have two. I've got another key space killer video. That's my original one. And then I have my, my to-do app. So those are for folks who may had already been using Astra and you wondered how to do that. So you can add multiple key spaces. Um, but for now, um, you know, for those who started brand new, you're going to see uh, what we do with the to-do app. So, okay. So now what we want to do is go back to our Git pod. I'll go back to mine. If you hadn't launched it already, uh, make sure in the very beginning, that was like that first button, just control click to launch this. And you will see it come to something that looks like this, right? You're going to see it launch the app. It does, by the way, Git pod, 
when you launch it the first time, there are some artifacts. It needs to pull some images and such, and it might take it just a moment. Um, but you're going to see something just like this with a terminal window. Now, what we want to do is in the default directory, and scroll back down to where we were. This is where this curl comes in. Now, there are other ways to do this. This is one way to do what we're just about to do to get the cred zip. Um, but what we're going to do is go back over to connect, like I said, pick driver. And I want you to right click on the download secure connect bundle. When you right click it, say copy link address. Now, what we're actually doing is we're just going to pull this directly into our app in Gitpod. That's why we're doing it this way. Um, so I'm going to say curl. This command, by the way, is right here. It's right here in the GitHub repository. So I'm going to say curl dash capital L. Don't forget the quotes. I'm going to paste in that link. I'm going to redirect that to a file called creds.zip. And what I should see, you'll notice that I received uh, a package. And if I do an ls-la there, you'll notice that I have a creds.zip. It's about 12K. That's about the right size, right? Now, one thing I would like to point out, when you're here in the app, this secure connect bundle link, this, this session will expire after about like five minutes, right? It's a security feature, essentially. So if for some reason that happens and you try to download it, and you find that the, the file in curl is like 300 bytes or something like that's really small, just refresh this page and do it again. Um, again, that is for security reasons. So just make sure that when you right click that and get that link address uh, that you do go in here and, and do the curl command pretty quick. And let's see. I, you may have to make your terminal oh, bigger. Yeah, let's make it bigger. You're right. Thank you for pointing that out. Otherwise it can be hard to read. We go to like mm -hmm. 1980s font sizes here, you know. <laughs> when we do the when we do workshops, right? It's a terminal, so but yeah, exactly. you can see that Gitpod is pretty powerful. So it's like Eclipse or any IDE, and everything is installed. So you can yeah. Maven, you can Java, you can npm if you want. There, everything's there. Yeah, GitHub GitHub's really cool. Okay, I see uh, Arturo in the chat is talking about an error. Oh, why is Spring Pet Clinic? Hmm. Where do you? Oh, you should, yeah. You shouldn't need to use that. Yeah, I. Clinic. You know, Arturo, that's really interesting. Why you're okay, seeing Spring see. Pet Clinic? Yeah, this is the definitely the one for the to do app. I guess let's make sure that you're in the right page. Yeah, so let let me copy the link address. Okay, Cedric, you'll do Try that. Try with this link. Okay. Yes. OK, you're going to drop that. If you could drop that in the chat as well in Slack, because that's where our two OK. Oh, you did. OK, thank you. Yeah, make yeah, sure. I yeah, think. we'll just make sure you're in the in the right spot there. Yeah, you shouldn't be at the Spring Pet Clinic. That's kind of. Yeah, so, yeah, so the curl yeah, command, perfect. what I'll do is I can't give you the exact curl command that I used, because this is going to be unique for mine. But I'll just go through that process again. So I'm going to go, let's say I was here. I'm going to go to connect connection method driver, I'll right click, say copy link address. Then I'm just going to copy. Notice in the GitHub repo right here. Matter of fact, I'll drop this. I'll go recopy it and I'll just drop this. So you have the, oh, you did it already. <laughs> Cedric's <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, That's I mean, great. you presenting. I, I appreciate that. Thing. So at this point, so I'm just going to type that command. So curl dash capital L, double quote. I'm going to paste that link in, double quote, redirect to creds.zip. Oh, OK. So Arturo missed the, missed the double quote. Ah. Uh, yes. So, it, so it, you did it great. Simply yes. Put, you, yeah. you did curl dash L, and you need to put double quote around the link. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's an easy miss, Arturo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, I wonder sometimes if we need to do something different in the text here to kind of expose that. Um, and then again, once you've done that, if you do an ls, an ls dash al, you should see I have a creds.zip. And about, like I said, the size will be about 12K, right? You should see something like that. Okay, good. I, yes. I, think, I think folks are getting it. Wonderful. Then from there, I'm just going to the next set of instructions. So what I want to do is we're going to move our creds.zip down a directory. So you notice I'm going to move creds.zip into Spring Boot to Do app, and then I'm going to change directory to Spring Boot to Do app. 
And again, if I do an LS here, you'll see I have my creds.zip along with my palm and everything. You can kind of watch that. Okay, good. I see a thumbs up there. Wonderful. All righty. Now, once I'm at this point, now I can go ahead and, and perform the Maven step. So this is something, if you notice that Cedric just talked about this a second ago, um, Gitpod is awesome. I mean, we're not behind Gitpod, but we we love it. It's it's great. Um, you can you can by default you can actually install a lot of this stuff right by default in your configuration. Um, but it's it's really flexible. You can you know work in a bunch of different languages. Um, a lot of stuff is available. So now I don't even notice. I don't have to install Maven, right? I can just say this, and Maven's already here, and I will mm, download okay. the world. Yeah, go ahead, Cedric. No, I just uh, had myself for a sec. I'm in front of the prompt. Ah, right, right. No problem. I will be there soon. Yeah, so all I did was copy this. And again, we can drop this down in the chat as well. Ooh, I'm going to beat Cedric on that one. <laughs> OK, do it, do it. <laughs> Success. <laughs> all right, so then it'll, it'll, it doesn't download as much of the world. Uh, you should see the success at this point. And now we can move to the first exercise. Um, and let me know, Leah, let us know if you run in, into any trouble at this point. And hopefully you're here with us and we'll keep an eye yeah, on the chat. It was a tricky part. Yeah, it was a tricky part. Yeah, and the cool thing, zip downloaded. yeah, and once you have the zip, you're all good to go. From this yes. point, what we're just about to do, you're going to see how easy it is to now connect up to our Cassandra database in Astra. And that's kind of the point, right? You only need this once and boom, you can use this all over the place in your, in your app. All right, so what we want to do now is we're going to navigate uh, in, um, in our IDE. We're going to navigate to the directory here, the Spring Boot To Do app, Spring Boot To Do app, really source test Java com data sex example. So I'm going to go to source. You see, uh, I've been playing in here earlier. It does save your state, by the way. Yeah, there we go. Uh, down to, so again, source test Java com data stacks examples. Now, the first one we want to bring up is going to be this connectivity to Astra explicit. It's the first one here, this one. And let me open this up a little bit so you can see it. Now, what we're doing, this is like the simplest pass, if, if you will. Um, all this is doing is, you know, essentially setting uh, the values directly in our class here. Now, would I ever want to explicitly store things like my username and password directly in the class? Probably not. We're just using this as a quick example to show you like the quickest and dirtiest way to get going, right? Um, but notice that here, this Astra zip file variable I have, um, it's going to reference the directory in the creds.zip we just created. Then again, uh, if you use the username and password that we uh, said before, KV user, KV password, and then our key space. And let's see. Somehow, Cedric, Arturo has the Spring Pet Clinic stuff coming yeah, up. I yes, I, I just wondering, um, maybe he click on the wrong Git pod link. Maybe the Git pod link at the very beginning of the read. Oh, the Google yeah. Let me check. OK, yeah, Cedric, hey, Arturo, Cedric is going to take a look. And uh, he'll, he'll see what he can find on that one. OK, so just make sure that these values fit whatever you chose. If you use the values from the workshop, you should be good. But if you did do something separate, put those here. Uh, and then later on in the code, as we scroll down, You'll see this is it. So in Cassandra, when you're using the drivers, you're going to establish something called a CQL session. The CQL session is the object that manages everything for your database connection, your connection pools, all sorts of things. Uh, so we want to establish, we want to initialize one of those. So we're going to use our builder. And in this case, all we're doing is passing this one line with Cloud Secure Connect Bundle. Uh, it passes the Secure Connect Bundle we used up here. And then our username and password and our key space and build. That alone right there is enough to establish a secure connection to the database and start working with it. And you'll see what we're doing here is in the logger, when we go to test to make sure this is working, uh, we're going to use that CQL session. We're going to get some metadata from our database to get the key space that we're working with. So once you're at that point, now all I have to do is run the test. So I'll go ahead and drop this here. And I will drop it in the chat as well and the other chat. And then if that all works, now it's going to go ahead. It's going to initialize connection to the database. We're just using this to make sure it works. I see a success. If I take a look at my output, boom. OK, connection established to Astro with key space to do app. Now, in our, in our um, 
output our log, we didn't hard code in the to-do app, right? It's actually getting the key space that we're working with. So we know that it has successfully connected to the database. Good, that worked. So we know that this particular pattern for connecting is working properly and we've, we've got the basic plumbing in place. All right, how are we doing? Okay. So now in the next one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the next class that we have here, this connectivity to Astra with conf test. Now, here's the difference with this one. In the first one, we explicitly set all the values for our connection right in the code, right? But that's not really a best practice. Obviously, again, we don't want to store our username and password like right in our code. What we can do with the drivers is configure an application.conf in our app, put all the configuration there. And then it's very simple to just tell the driver, hey, go look at the application.conf. It'll use those settings, and then you're good to go. So that's what we're going to do in this second test. So you'll notice here in this test, we still have our CQL session that hasn't changed. The one difference though is we're gonna get our resource, our application conf. Uh, if I go over to my resources, I have my application conf. So if I take a look at that, you'll see um, some settings in here, things like what's my key space, where my secure connect bundle is. And again, you shouldn't have to change these if you have followed uh, the instructions there in the repo uh, and then the username and password. Another thing we've done here is we've increased the timeouts. Um, if you're in, you know, if, if you're in a location that maybe has um, a slower connection to the internet or, or or something like that, or maybe the region you have to connect to is, is a little far away, it's good to just increase these, right? So you don't time out soon. So we've increased these to 10 seconds just to make sure for slow connections that that's okay. Um, the key point though is that none of the configuration is in my class. It's all in my application.com file. All right, so with that, now I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Here's the next test. So this is the one that we're using to use the config file. I'll go ahead and drop those. And after I do this, I'll wait just a minute, make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, I figured. All right, so we're running this one. This one now is going from the config file. Again, I should see the same thing, right? You see our log output. We're going to establish a connection, but we're going to use the database <laughs> metadata to pull the actual key space name. And it looks like that was good. And here it is. So I know that I've connected now with my configuration file. OK, so with that, I'm going to wait for a moment. Just let's get some thumbs up, make sure that folks are with us. Um, and we'll see what's going on with Arturo there. Yeah, that is. Um, yeah, I have no idea why Arturo is in the in this the pet clinic key workspace. <laughs> I'll just get another minute. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so Cedric, you're working with Arturo. Great. Yeah, I'm so curious to find out what's going to happen there. OK, got it. All right, let's see. Now, one thing while we're waiting, I just want to point out um, is at this point, all we have done is establish a connection to the database. Right? We haven't created any tables or anything like that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to my CQL console. We're going to do this a little bit later. We're going to verify some things a little bit later in the in the repo and the instructions. But I'm just going to do it real fast just to take a look. So I'm going to take a look at my key spaces. Oh, I should probably blow this one up too, huh? There we go. Yeah. And we see that we have the to-do app one. So I want to use to-do app. And now I'll describe my tables. OK, so I need to drop this. This is the one that I remember I said I was working with before. Because we didn't, we haven't actually created this table yet. <laughs> yes. Wait, what the? Oh, you know something? Why was that even there? That's interesting. Helps if I use the right stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. It's not. You can't just. Right you now. have to tell it that you're going to drop a table, right? You know, <laughs> details, yes. right? Yeah. Let's try that again. There we go, much better. OK, so I don't have a table or anything like that. I've just established a connection to the database. And um, 
And I see that Arturo dropped an image. OK. All right, so what I'm going to do in this next one, when you go to exercise two here, now we're going to create the schema real time with code and test some inserts out. So what I want to do here is now we're going to navigate to that, to that same section, but source test Java com data sex examples here. There we go down here. And now you see this create schema and Astra test, right? Now notice what we're doing here. At this, at this point, we're actually going to use our application conf again. We're using the same configuration and setup that we had before. But this time, we're now going to go ahead and essentially create the table. You see the simple statement. We're just creating a statement with the driver. Um, all this, by the way, all this uh, to do this repository, to uh, table to do, these are variables that are in our to do this repository. Um, interface. We'll look at that in a second, actually. Um, it's just pulling the values out uh, for the columns and everything that we're using there. Uh, but we're actually creating the table. So we're going to create the table, our partition key, our columns, and then it's going to execute that. And a matter of fact, yeah, I should pull that up. Let me pull it up. Yeah, and we can still go back to slide a bit because um, we did not introduce which table we need. That's true. Yeah, let's do that. I stop bef yeah, I stop a little bit before and I think during the time people connect and give it some time. Oh up. hey, look, Arturo has the right, he's got the right one. Woo! Yes. That was yes. so interesting that that got into the wrong workspace like that. Cool. That's our fault. We do we probably have some wrong links. I somewhere. we must, yeah. So we'll we'll have to fix that. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for being yeah, patient. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you're moving in the right place now. Great. All right, so Cedric, did you want to talk to these a little bit um, and before we move on a little bit more? Uh, sure. So if you remember what I said about multi-layer in a Spring Boot, so for the controller, we will use Spring Web, Spring Web MVC using REST controller. We don't need any service layer because there is no aggregation, composition. We will simply go directly to the repository with to-do list repository. And we will inject the repository into the controller layer. And then we will use um, pretty clever tools known, named Swagger that will, based on annotation you provide in the controller layer, will generate a working client. And by the way, this is the one uh, David used uh, before, and it's pretty powerful. So not only it can do a post, put, patch, uh, get all the HTTP method, but it can also handle uh, HTTP basic and spring security if you would need to. And what's really cool about it, when you take a look at the, the implementation classes for it, for the REST, for the REST endpoint, the REST API, um, you don't have all of that UI code that we have in Swagger, you don't have to write any of it, right? It's provided for you and you use the annotations to hook all that up. It's really nice, actually. Yeah. OK, so next slide. Let's see what we got. OK, so <clears throat> what uh, entity and query do we need with this app? So to build a data model with Cassandra, you need entities and queries. So if you look at entities, pretty obvious, right? You need a task with a UID, a title, complete, not complete, and the order just to be able to put them in the right order on the UI. Next. And then for queries, we simply need create, read, update, delete. No, uh, no real um, complex queries. But this is the workflow you need to follow just to be able to create the Cassandra data model. So let's go that route with the to do app. We simply have a single table to do task, having all the attributes from our task. And we will use UID as our full primary key. Um, yeah, don't go into too much detail. Yeah, it's, I today. think it, this I think one's that. pretty self-explanatory because it's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Uh, between exactly. the, the various uh, items that we need for our tasks and then what we're implementing here in the table. Yes, and because we do have a UID, it's pretty easy to do insert and get by ID, delete by ID, update by ID. 
the ID is the only key we need to interact with the to-do app ready. So see, that's pretty straightforward, simple table. And <clears throat> so in the to-do list repository, uh, all these uh, constants for my tables, I've put them as constants. This is a trick uh, because if tomorrow I need to change one colon, except UID, you cannot change the primary key, uh, then if you want to rename a colon, you can. And then in your code, you simply have to update one constant and everything is updated. And if for some reason you won't get rid of one colon, you just remove the constants and you can see everywhere in your code where you need that value. Okay, so uh, queries, list all the tasks, create a new task, uh, update, delete, and delete all, okay? By the way, all the slides we are showing are on the GitHub repo yes. we shared with you. It's a PDF, so if, if I go too fast, you, you can simply go back to the slide and, and download them. Uh, we give you away everything. Yeah, so you'll see at the very top in the table of contents, there is a link for the slide deck or just in the repo, you can see the slides here. They're all presented for you. Yeah, so you can totally go and do this at your own pace um, if you need to later on. Exactly. This workshop is really designed to be self-service if you need to. So you do have the slide deck, the slides, both Astra and Gitpod are free and you can use it uh, free forever when you need. So go, if, you, if we go back to to-do list repository, you can see the signatures of our method, find by ID, so find by primary key. There might be a task or not, so I'm using optional. And so to create or update, I will simply define an upsert because just for you to know, in Cassandra, Every, um, every um, insert is an upsert. If the task already exists, if I insert a task with an ID and I execute exactly the same statement, I don't get any error uh, record already exists. It will be updated. So every insert is an upsert in Cassandra. So let's go directly single method upsert. And I will delete by ID because ID is my full primary key. Okay, so I think I think that's what you were after, though, because we, I, if I remember, Cedric, we started getting into the to do list repository interface, but we didn't actually tell them what it was. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So you know, exercise one and two was okay because I mean connectivity. Um, yeah, so it's not kind of connectivity, but now. If you go to exercise three, where you will create the tables and do statement, you need to know what the table look like. Right, right. Okay, so with that, I haven't actually done exercise two. Um, so now uh, that we have a little bit more explanation of what this to-do list repository actually is, right? Um, and then of course, is, um, as Cedric is pointing out, uh, you know, the various underlying objects that then support, um, here we go, uh, like implement from the from the driver standpoint. So we've got our to-do list repository, we have our method signatures, but then what's going on underneath the hood, right? So as you mentioned for the upsert, it's really just doing an insert because of the way that Cassandra works, right? So if we take a look at the upsert method, the actual implementation, you can see, oh, look, here's something familiar. Here's an insert statement, right? And then I'm gonna add in uh, the values for, for each of those. And this is how we're gonna interact with our task list uh, you know, when the when a call comes in from the REST API, then as you remember, when I went to the Swagger API, right, you had, you know, get a list of all the tasks or, you know, insert a task. It's it's actually calling these methods here in the backend. All right, so we've got that in place. So what I'm going to do is I want to run this test. We're still in the tested spot, right? Um, so the key thing is now we're going to go back over to our create schema and ask for test if you haven't done that already because this is where we started talking to that to-do list repository. So I'm going to run this test and I will drop these down here. <laughs> you beat, beat you. me again. I beat you. <laughs> well, I have to copy it myself oh. anyway, right? 
So, so this one's a little different. Where before we were just validating that we were making the connection to the database. This time we're actually going to create a table, right? And it did say success. So let's go to take a look. If you remember before I did in fact drop it. Um, so I'm going to look at my key spaces and did that get smaller again? I could swear I had made that bigger, but we'll do this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say use to do app mm -hmm. describe my tables. Now mm -hmm. I have a to do desk table, but there's nothing in here because we haven't actually created any data. So it's empty, mm -hmm. but you can see yep. I've got the fields that we created, my UID, my completed offset and title. Uh, so at this point, we've used our code to connect to the database, create the table that we want to work with. And now we get to start inserting some data and hooking it up a little bit more. Okay. So in the next one, uh, this is this is the part I, I said I kind of cheated and I went forward to the CQL console. This is what we're showing you here. So if I went back to that summary view you're probably in, uh, you'll see CQL console here. And if you click that, it'll automatically put you into the console. Yes, Cedric? Uh, you might notice that you don't have to uh, authenticate anymore. Yes, it just logs no. you in. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, I think in the README, they may ask you to provide user and password. You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, that's right. It'll automatically log you in. This is, this is a slightly older screenshot right here uh, where you used to have to type those in. Yeah, you just click on it. It'll log you in. You should get a prompt that looks just like that. Yes, it's, yeah. it's evolving so fast. As hard, just great. Yeah, and so for those, by the way, those commands that I've been typing in here this whole time, I wasn't expecting all of you to know what they were. You'll see here in the GitHub repo that we're giving you the commands. So you know, to use to do app, describe. Matter of fact, if I were to do the way that it is here in the repo, where I say describe a table and specify the exact table, I'll get a little bit more information uh, compared to what I was doing before. You can see here's that create table statement. And matter of fact, if we take a look at our slides again, go back, here it is, right? This should look just like what we're seeing over here, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty darn close. The only difference is the way it's being uh, denoted here with the primary key, but it's, it's the same exact table. All right, so now what we want to do is move up a little bit. We're going to put in some data. There it is. OK, so now uh, we want to open this class. You'll see it's CRUD with Astra test. So now that we have our table created, we're going to just run a test that's going to do a simple insert. Now, notice, though, it's using the same exact pattern that we saw uh, when we were interacting with our taskless repository. That's exactly what we'd want, really. right? And this is just a test to, to ensure it's all going. So the sample title, I forgot what it is, but I've changed it to CCOS Awesomeness. Um, so, and you'll see this here. Yeah, it was a task. That's right. A task is the sample title. So you can put, honestly, whatever you want uh, in, in that class. And oh, by the way, I should point this out. I totally forgot. Uh, Git pod by default does not save. Uh, I have my auto save on. So make sure you're saving uh, because if you change any values before and you're like, why isn't this working? It might be because you just need to save. So I turn on auto save or you can you say. Oh, by the way, David, between you and I, I know how to enable autosave. Oh, yay. We need to start app. enabling autosave. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yes. now I'm going to run this last test. I'll drop these in here. OK. And this is to insert some data. And again, if you remember a moment ago, I didn't have any data. Um, Right. It should be empty. I'm mm -hmm. going to come here. I'm going to run this test. Give it a second. OK, success. So good. It says the task created and gave me the UUID. I go back over to my CQLSH console. There we go. My data is in place. So I know now that my code is working with connectivity and basic CRUD operations to put something into the database.
All right, and then we're gonna go to the, the last one here, exercise three, but you know, I'm gonna give a moment for everyone to catch up. I also have a complaining dog behind me. So I'm gonna go <laughs> take care of that real quick. Uh, give me just a moment. Oh, was it you? I mean, I was thinking it was something else talking. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's funny, you know, real condition. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you were all hearing. <laughs> But this I is mean, what happens I... when you do conferences from home, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I was wondering, was it me, you know, <laughs> or any anyone else? No, no. Okay, oh, that's, that's great. All right, that's great. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, like I said, yes. Now we have some data, so we know that the basic plumbing, the basic, you know, the basic plumbing to our database is hooked up with our app. Um, so now going to exercise three. By the way, uh, oh, I see Arturo is typing something. I was going to say, if I can get some thumbs up, let us know. Uh, for those of you following along, if you're with us, and I did see Arturo typing a second ago, so I'll just keep an eye on that. Okay, so now that was all from our, our unit test, right? We're just using that to just test out to ensure that we do in fact have that connectivity, that we can work with the database. But that really didn't do anything for the actual application itself. Um, so now what we want to do is take a look at the Cassandra driver config. This is going to be the place uh, where we are going to set the application Cassandra configuration. This is how we're going to manage what the uh, uh, the configuration parameters and such we're going to use for our database. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm laughing at Arturo <laughs> that we should take a meme for that's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, we should. All right, so um, all right, so let's go to our. Uh, back to our application up here. Um, so you notice under our source main Java, you know, com data sex, we have conf and conf and Cassandra driver config. Now here's something that's really cool. Notice there's not much in Cassandra driver config. Um, it looks quite empty. So how exactly am I configuring to talk to my database? Well, remember if I use, if I drop an application conf in my resources directory, all I have to do to initialize that application conf is say builder.build. If I do, if I use this pattern, it will look for the application.conf automatically and it'll pull all the configuration from there. So it actually greatly simplifies what this particular configuration class looks like. So this is it right here. This is enough to connect my database because again, it's going to use that application conf that has all the data, all the connection parameters um, that I would use. And yes, and if you're familiar with uh, Spring Boot and you're asking yourself why all these constants are not part of application.yaml, well, if, if you open back this these file, David, you can see that there is a lot there. So we yeah. simply put, we simply say, okay, all the Cassandra settings should be in a dedicated file. And that's pretty easy. You can change that without changing your code. Exactly. Not in the application that you have. Yeah, and imagine, you know, if you have an application that's on yeah. development, it's in staging, it's in production, right? You have multiple environments. This is just a really nice way that you could have a different application conf for wherever your application is. You don't need to touch a bit of code. And Arturo is saying, um, I'm familiar. I still have a nightmare of Spring Boot when I worked at Semantic. I'm so curious, Arturo, as to what that story is. <laughs> All right. So like I said, we're going to use that application.conf um, from the resources folder. That'll configure the connection. Mm -hmm. And we already kind of we already talked really about that to do this repository. So I'm just going to scroll past that piece. Uh, the same thing with the implementation, right? That's where we actually see um, the implementation of the interface and the underlying details of what we're actually doing when we delete or we upsert. Um, and all those types of things. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, and we, we kind of talked about these things, but now this is getting into the REST, the REST controller. So let's pop over to our REST controller. Now this is this to me, and Cedric, I don't know if you're gonna have I, I assume you're gonna have more you want to say about this. This is actually some of the coolness as far as I'm concerned of spring and how it works. Um, because of as I mentioned before, 
to have a whole REST API implementation, instead of having to write that code ourselves, the Spring Framework does so much of it for us. And being able to use annotations like this, right, at REST controller and then define um, what those endpoints are going to look like. So if you remember our Swagger API before, we had like slash API slash v1 slash to do's. We literally are defining that right here, right? Um, and then we've got the implementation and the Spring, the Spring framework is doing a lot of this for us, right? It's all this other stuff that's coming. We I get that for free. I don't have to code any of this up. I don't know if there's any more you want to say about that, Cedric, in that section. Um, no, all okay. good. Okay, I'm just checking. Yeah, so without, now this is the big part right here, right? So we've performed tests at this point, um, but we haven't actually run the app. Um, so that's what we want to do in this next piece. Now this is again using Spring Boot uh, with Maven. And what's nice is notice I don't have to create a war file. I don't have to deploy this. I can just literally come, especially for a microservice, this is really nice and say Spring Boot Run, Maven Spring Boot Run like this, and it will run the app. Now, something that Gitpod is going to do, uh, when you expose a port in Gitpod, it's going to give you this little dialog um, and say, hey, do you want to make this publicly available? Do you want to open a browser? That kind of thing. Um, again, that's really nice, especially if you're, let's say you're working with the team or if you're testing on your own. And now this will expose the port for me. It'll generate the URL. You'll see that here in a second. Um, this is what I expect. I actually have to give it um, the rest of the, the URI. Um, but you notice, see this 8080. So we had exposed port 8080 for our application. Um, and Gitpod will actually generate this, this URL that you see like this. This will be unique to your instance. Um, well, the cool thing is that now if I take a look, I do see that my app is up and it's running. So now if I grab the rest of this, right? Uh, this is for the Swagger UI in particular. I can just go here. Did I forget my, oh, let's put a slash there. Slash is useful. There we go. And now boom, there's my Swagger UI, right? Um, so all of these are implemented. This is actually coming from my REST controller. Uh, so as again, as you saw me, if I now that we've played around in here a little bit and I do have something in place, if I go to my Swagger UI and get my complete list of tasks and execute, there we go. Remember, this is what I sh should have seen earlier, but I didn't because I had by accident removed all my data. But yeah, you see, this is what we created with the code earlier with our test. And now we can see that is exposed here in the Swagger UI. Let's see. Oh, it looks like cool. Yeah, I see. I'm looking at Arturo's screenshot there. All right. And then if we want to, we can play around here a little bit. And again, insert some tasks or something. If I want to say create a new task. <clears throat> yes. Um, so we do have a question. Oh, what do we have? Uh, so um, did we use Spring Initializer to create this project? So yes. Um, if you, yeah, anybody can go to uh, start.spring.io and you can initialize a template for your project. Um, so I picked Spring Web to have a REST API, Spring Test to do uh, testing. And I think I put also Spring Actuator to get the monitoring. You can see all these dependencies in the POM. Yep. So this is what David showing right now. But I did not pick Spring Data, for instance, for this demo. Um, I do have the same project working with Spring Data, but today was very, keep it very simple. Simply use the basic drivers, connect, and do a few queries. So yes, we used uh, Spring Initializer as a starter, but we added uh, some dependencies on our own after. Yeah, and you can see the Spring Boot starter there. I think I passed up web. Um, I must have, yeah, it's up here. But that's pretty cool, yeah. I, I wouldn't start any yeah. Spring Boot yeah. project without start.spring.io now. It's, you know, way simpler. Yeah, it is It is actually kind of awesome how easy they made to like just start up an application from nothing and you get all this stuff built in. All right, so hopefully at this point, you're you're here, right? Uh, if you've been following along, um, I know Arturo has been putting some screenshots in, in for us. So you can get to a point where you see the Swagger UI that exposes the REST API that is then hooked up to your um, Apache Cassandra database with Astra. 
And, you know, I've already kind of, I've been exploring this, you know, getting the list of tasks, you can kind of explore uh, the REST API. Now, something that's really interesting and can be um, you know, pretty fun here is um, if you want, right? So in this particular workshop, we're really just exposing the, the, Swagger, the Swagger API here, the back end piece of the REST implementation. Um, but as we talked about in the beginning, um, there is a front end, right? There's a front end on to the to do MVC where you can hook this up and you can hook this up full end to end, have a full working front end implementation along with the back end. Um, now we're not doing that today, but if you take a look at the very, very bottom here, you'll see this other link that brings you to another one of our workshops and it goes into a lot of detail and it will hook up all everything. It'll hook up the whole thing. Um, so you're always welcome to go take a look at that if you want. <laughs> That's so cool. I see Jemil de Jesus Enriquez. Oh, sorry if I scorched your name. Sharing is swagger. Super happy to have the app starting. Cool. I, I think I just saw um, somebody post the link of theirs. Oh, let's take a look. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, I, I did that. <laughs> it. It worked. It cool. should work. Yeah. That's actually. It's. I love that about this. Yeah, so this uh, this came from uh, Jimiel. Yeah, boom, right. So so if we want to be really fun, right, I'm gonna totally create data in your thing. <laughs> <laughs> Will you? <laughs> I am. Yeah. No. No. I am. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, maybe you need to change UID just to be sure. You know, maybe you already oh. have created one with the existing UID. No, that one was a brand new one, but I guess I could just do that. Oh. Yeah. All right. But we should. I, okay, so Jamil gets to gets to check us here, and um, here I'll do it this way. And now, if I get the list of them, hopefully, Jamil, you didn't put any terrible task in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boom! Yeah, Jamil's been busy. Yeah, here they are. They're both in here. Super yeah. cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So again, you can imagine what that might look like when you are collaborating with the team or maybe you have some code that you've deployed and you want somebody else to go take a look at it and maybe do some tests or, or whatever. Uh, Gitpod makes it really, really simple to, to collaborate and stuff. There's, there's a lot more features. Obviously, we're not doing a workshop on Gitpod. It is seriously cool, though. It's a really cool tool. Yeah, that was cool. All right. All right, so let's see. So that's it as far as that part goes. Now we get into a couple more slides, and then we're going to um, we're going to do the quiz. We're going to get into the quiz. Yeah, we can go quick through the through the slides. This is uh, mostly for reference for yeah. you. Just exactly. Okay, so let's do this real fast. All right. So as we mentioned before, um, the data sex drivers for Cassandra um, they actually do a ton for you. It's not just for data sex Astra, it's for open source Apache Cassandra, it's for data sex enterprise, right? You can use them for any of the flavors. Um, one of the, I think to me, one of the best features of that is you can use the same exact drivers, hook up to Astra in the free tier as, you know, from a development standpoint, experiment, figure out your data models, kind of get your initial plumbing going. And then let's say that your IT department has their own Cassandra deployment. All you have to do is change like one configuration parameter, but use the same exact driver. So instead of using the Secure Connect bundles, you'd probably use you know your contact points, um, and you connect up to your your say your, your development cluster or something, or or your production cluster, something that's provided inside your own organization. It's the same drivers. It's the same everything. You don't need to change your code. Um, so that's that's really nice. It's really flexible. Um, but it's more than that. So as I mentioned before, uh, when you were talking to Astra, right, we're actually simplifying a lot. Uh, because when you're when you're talking to a direct Cassandra database, and it would be like this for any distributed database, you have to know you know um, you have to know where the database is. It's the same thing for MySQL or anything, right? You need an IP address. You need to know where it is. Um, especially anyone here done SSL in Java, it's not fun at all, yeah. at all. Um, the the Secure Connect bundle does it all for you, right? So it it does simplify a lot. Um, so what happens is, again, you just use that secure connect bundle. It will automatically manage the connection for you between you and your, your Astra um, database. But there's more. So 
The drivers support all the main languages out there. So we're talking Java today, but they're definitely not the only ones. But if you take a look here on the left-hand side, this part, I, I never honestly thought I'd get excited talking about drivers, uh, database drivers. I've been working <laughs> with databases for a long time, but this stuff is really cool. And here's why. So imagine you have a distributed database. Imagine you have one that's got a thousand nodes, right? Um, you might, even one that has five nodes. Um, you, the first question that comes to people's mind is, well, is, do I need a load balancer? Um, how's it gonna know what node to go to for what data? The driver handles all of that for you, right? So there are load balancing policies that are already in place. Um, they're pretty smart. So they're gonna look at, they're gonna optimize for um, which nodes should get a particular request. And what's cool in Cassandra uh, is because it's a peerless, it's a, uh, not a peerless, it's a, a leaderless peer-to-peer -peer system. So any node can do what any other node does any node in your cluster can receive the request and it will know what to do to facilitate that request. What this means then is the driver could end up talking to any one of the nodes and it's going to optimize for which node is best to get the particular query that you're essentially trying to execute um, to, to have the fastest response time to ensure nodes aren't getting overloaded, all of this. And it's doing it by default in the drivers as they already are. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we say like token and data center aware load balancing policies. Um, there are retry and reconnection policies in there. So if a node goes down or for some reason there's a network partition and it can't see one, it'll automatically retry it, all sorts of things. So this is being done for you. Connection pools are being maintained for each of your nodes. That's another reason why your session, your SQL session object, you only need one. You treat it as a singleton in your app because like I said, it is more an expensive object. Um, that is maintaining all of this. Uh, it does maintain gossip with your cluster. Uh, so it knows the state of your cluster, right? So it's it's talking to your nodes just like any other node in your cluster uh, does. So there is a ton, there's a reactive API in there. We have a whole nother workshop on that. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with asynchronous programming, um, if you're if you're not familiar with reactive, it's definitely something to take a look at. It's it's a really nice evolution of the asynchronous API and how to, how to work with that. That's all supported there. Right, so there's there's a ton that the drivers do for you right out of the box uh, that you don't have to code on your own. Let's see, is there any? Does it support Angular? Um, I would I would say like through things like GraphQL, um, through more of the REST endpoint, the, the GraphQL endpoint. Yes, I don't think that there's a driver that supports Angular directly, like because that's JavaScript. Uh, Unless you can tell me yeah, otherwise. So, um, so. We do have a JavaScript driver, so it will simply, you know, be can be used in any GS uh, framework. But I don't think we are using advanced function from Angular if there are some object mapping, for instance. We have our own, so that's totally doable on Angular. But I don't sure we are using advanced function from Angular. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. There's the node driver, duh. Yeah, there's the node driver. It's really? Sitting, it's sitting and right it's, in front of me. It's and, in the middle of your screen. And, and we've used it how many times? <laughs> yeah. Because this is because I'm doing all the code, you know. Yeah. And nice. you're just showing that code. Nice. No, I'm just nice. kidding. Cedric has thrown shade. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So as we as we talked before, you saw this in the example with the test where we're doing explicit settings. Again, this isn't something I would recommend doing in a in a real live app. Um, as far as like storing your username and password, that kind of thing. It's just an example. This is like if you're creating your first app and connecting up to uh, Astra, this is the simplest thing you can do to connect to the database and get going. Uh, but the example we showed you, again, is using the application comp. This is definitely the more provided uh, or preferred method to use. And if you are using your application comp, this is it to, to initialize your SQL session. You just need SQL session .build, or build. It will know to look in the resources directory and use the application comp. Um, we already talked about using as a singleton. So I'm not going to restate that. But one thing you should get in the habit of is to ensure that you close out on applications uh, shutdown, ensure that you are closing out your session. On some languages, it will it'll do this for you automatically. But it's a good practice just to, to make sure that you are, in fact, doing it explicitly. And then you know we ran through uh, all of these tests and such. So, um, all right, yeah, I guess yeah. Let me see. We've got we've got time. Cool. All right. So when you're working with the driver, um, it, it's very simplest execution. Uh, if you have your SQL section session object, 
if you say dot execute, you can pass in a query or a statement, and there you go, you can execute that query. That is the simplest way to do it. Now, this is good when you're just first starting up uh, and you're just, again, testing out to make sure you have connection and things are working. I would never suggest using this for real, um, just because it's it's kind of, it exposes you to, to, to some, some potential uh, um, issues that you can come into to play, security issues, things like that. Um, I would definitely start using your, your statement objects. Um, the simplest one is the simple statement. Uh, simple statements are really good if you know that you're going to execute a query once. You may have noticed that in a lot of the tests that we did, they were using simple statements. Um, in your simple statements, you can either do an explicit definition like you see here. Again, this would be vulnerable to something like a SQL injection. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't suggest doing this in, in real code. This is uh, something you might want to do when you're just first testing. Um, but it's probably a good idea to externalize your parameters, uh, whether you used uh, positional values like you see here with the question mark, or if you want to use name values, either way works. The key thing is this. Once you create your statement object, you just pass that to that same SQL session dot execute, and it will execute that statement. Now, when using Cassandra, the suggested, the much preferred path is to use a prepared statement, right? Um, this really comes down to optimizing uh, the amount of times that you have to parse and compile your statements and reducing network traffic. Imagine we're talking about Apache Cassandra database. Uh, Cassandra database is an individual node can handle many, many thousands of operations a second on its own, right? Just one node. So imagine you've got an app that is handling, you know, um, multiple sets of thousands of operations a second, you don't want to have to be parsing and compiling your statement for every single one of those. And then, of course, passing that across uh, to your servers or anything like that. So when you prepare a statement, and all you have to do is use this prepared statement type. Um, so you say SQL session dot prepare. Now, this statement is actually going to get cached on the nodes where it's being used. And the only thing that you're passing along is the, is the payload of what the actual parameter values are, right? Um, so it again, it really reduces network traffic. And, and, and again, get, given a Cassandra database that can handle so many transactions or so many operations a second, this is a huge optimization. So generally speaking, you should be using a prepared statement. That's really what it comes down to, unless you have a good reason like in a, in a test. Um, once you create your prepared statement object, you'll see that later then we'll bind the variables. So I have my prepared statement PS. I'm now going to use a bound statement later on when I have the values, and I will just use my prepared statement object.bind and pass the values that I'll get passed into my parameters. And then I'll pass my bound statement to the execute uh, method. OK, so then with result sets, um, honestly, if you've been using Java for any time or really any language uh, with a database, whether it's a rel relational database or not, result sets have been around for some time. Um, those are the objects you're going to use to get the results back out of the database. They should look and feel pretty familiar if you've been doing that re with relational databases. Uh, so here you can see I've got my SQL session execute. Here's my statement. I'm going to pass that back to a result set object. Um, one big difference here is there are there are some extra metadata, extra information that are in the result sets that are particular to the way Cassandra works. Things like getting execution info um, that'll come into play later. Or if you want to do like a query trace or something, uh, you can get that. Um, and then the result sets themselves are they they you can pass back an iterator that you can use to just iterate over them. So if I do have multiple results in a result set, I can just iterate through those results. And here are some examples of working with result sets. Uh, so you see the first case, uh, I've got a result set here where I just want to get a single row that single result dot one. Uh, one thing to be careful with when using dot all is you know the default page size in Cassandra is 5,000. Uh, but Cassandra, you know you could have a database that's holding a petabyte of data, right? Um, so make sure that you're being very explicit in what you are returning. And if you do a dot all and you have a table that has a billion rows, you're going to, you know, it's, it's going to page by default, but you're telling it, I want to get, actually, the all is going to get them all um, because you're going to fetch all pages. So, so don't use dot all. <laughs> Unless you know, <laughs> unless you know that you have a very specified number of results that are coming back. Um, again, the results that are iterable, as you see in the for loop here in this example, uh, so you can very easily just go ahead and implement a for loop and iterate through um, those values. You can also use uh, lambda functions as well. 
And once you get a row, or once you, you know, if you want to pull out individual values, you know, visual columns, their types, you can see uh, a bunch of examples of doing this. Now, by the way, what we're providing in the slides, um, they're just, you know, a handful of examples to give you an idea of the feel of it. Um, this is all stuff that is in the documentation. If you remember in the slides in the very beginning, there was a documentation link to the driver. It's got all of the, you know, the, the gross implementation details as well. So this is just kind of giving you an example. Okay, we already passed through that part. Mm -hmm. um, Cedric, is there, you want to talk about this part here? Um, so I talked before about inversion of control. In the spring world, um, this is done either using constructor or auto-wired. Um, auto-wired, um, like, like we did that. Okay, and we provide the name of the implementation with the qualifier annotation. But today, as we have only one uh, implementation for our interface, we don't need the qualifier. Qualifier. All right. All right. And then again, this was in hands-on yes. exercise three, where this is the magic, right? This is the magic yeah, where yeah. I don't need to deploy a war or, okay. or anything like that and just run. And then yeah. here we go. All right. And with that, I will drop our part of the, I'll stop sharing and pass it over to Patrick. Um, thank you, by the way, everybody. I mean, we're going to still be here. We're not going anywhere because Patrick's going to talk and we'll be quiet for a moment. Um, but thank you, everybody, for, for being with us and being attentive and, and for your questions for the last two hours. I hope you got something out of it. And Patrick, it's all yours.